Let's do it. Okay. okay. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for this afternoon's uh, presentation. We're very excited to share with you a success story in modernizing Best Buy supply chain. With us today um, is Rob Bass from Best Buy. We also have with us Marvin Logan from Bastion Solutions. A little bit better. So again, I'd like, let me start over. I'd like to introduce uh, Rob Bass, the Chief Supply Chain Officer with Best Buy, Marvin Logan, who's the Vice President of Consulting with Bastion Solutions, and myself, Greg Connor, uh, Vice President of Sales with Bastion Solutions. So to get started here this afternoon, I'd like to turn things over to Rob. There you go. Let's just jump right in. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, well, Greg, thanks for having me here today. Um, honored to be here. I'm going to represent the work of a lot of uh, real smart men and women behind the scenes that have put this thing together on behalf of Best Buy. I just uh, get to be the mouthpiece for it all and go beg for money. So that's what I do. But to talk about this, uh, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about why we needed to modernize our supply chain. And then I'm going to let these guys go into some of the, the data pieces and um, how we selected the right technology. So I came over, I think, if you guys don't know the Best Buy story, let me give it to you really quick. Five or six years ago, everybody said we were going out of business. Did you guys all get the news on that? Yeah, some people still are surprised when they hear that we're in business. But we were certain to be doomed because uh, there's this competitor that starts with the letter A. They're a really good company. Um, that what they do, they do really, really well. And there was this thing called showrooming, and showrooming was, just had to run us out of business. Um, so as we thought about that, really, you know, you guys think about this in your own lives. The only way you're going to compete in that environment is a lot of what we sell, I don't know about you, but in this connected home environment, you want to sort of talk to somebody. You know, how do you talk to Alexa, and how does that Sonos system work, and how do you do it? It's hard to buy that stuff online and figure it out. So we knew if we could price match, allow you to come in, talk about the product, see how to use it, price match so that you didn't have to feel like you had to buy it online and you could walk home with it that day, that would be our differentiator. The problem though, as the CEO told me when I took the job, is that, Rob, we, we can't afford to price match. In fact, we can't even afford our prices right now, that's why we're in trouble. So what are we gonna do with our supply chain? How are we gonna become more efficient? And by the way, as we get more efficient, I also need you to be faster uh, and we need to compete in a different way. So that's what we were up against. Now this is the part of the story where I just figured we'd hire a bunch of people and start putting in automation day one. But wh what we realized quickly is one, we didn't have a lot of capital to invest. And two, we just didn't have the expertise internally. We have a, a bunch of great, great members of our team but some of the areas of expertise you need, we didn't have on, the, on our team. And second, um, this is kind of hard to explain, but it's true. We didn't necessarily, in all of our facilities across the country, work on the weekends. And so our, really our hours of operation and how we did business didn't match in this kind of modern day world. And so we had to get the right team. We had to go out and tell the truth, tell our team members out in DCs why they needed to work differently. We had to bring in a, a few, some new talented people in headquarters. So we got the team right. Then the systems, right? We had an old green screen WMS. We make the joke that it was old enough to smoke and drink in every state in the country. There was just no way that, that our systems behind the scenes were ever gonna hook up with any kind of automation and you know, an Xacta system, a warehouse execution system that could talk to an auto store and do the things we needed to do. So we had to get that flipped around. So really built that foundation around our software and our systems. Then we started to get to the stuff that I originally thought we'd get to was, you know, what are the right MHE solutions? And I'll talk about how we, we thought about that. And then once you had the, the people, the software, the right MHE solutions, then how does our network look different? I don't know about you guys, but I came up in the ranks where you built, you built like a million and a half, two million square foot facilities, they're L-shaped, and you built them uh, out in the middle of nowhere where there was a major highway, 
right? So you could uh, truck things into your stores. That really doesn't work in this environment anymore. So then, when we had all this in place, how did we feel about our network and how did we want to redesign our network? Make sense, everybody tracking? All right. The other unique thing we had going as we, we thought about all this was the, um, I call this the pro proliferation of repack, if you will. I used to fight this. I have a few members of my team in the room, and for many years I used to fight. I used to fight about case pack size and why can't the vendor do this or that or whatever. We had an epiphany about three years ago and said, you know what? Most of our stuff at, you know, at a Best Buy, we, we don't send a pallet of these to our stores. Like in the old days, you had a pallet of maybe four picture tube TVs. We, and we generally don't even send a case of these, right? Our stores don't need 40 rose gold, 256 gigabyte iPhone 10s. Our inventory costs would go through the roof. So 60% of our units are repack right now. 80% of our SKUs, we, will cut, we are willing to cut the box open if we need to. And this is just part of what you have to do in this day and age. And if you tie in with that, the, the explosion in e-commerce, almost all of our passes through our DCs were just turning into an each environment. So of course, you, you got to make sure that your inventory, you can co-mingle your store replenishment inventory with your e-commerce inventory, make that pass, be as efficient as you can. But that was the other unique thing we had going on. And then you talk about this world of, you know, just in time on the supply chain side or even on the final mile side, how fast you have to be to compete. Obviously, that was looming against us as well. So this is a little bit, I, I don't have the actual, we don't have the audio on here, I'm gonna try and talk through it. The other interesting thing we had is, we're growing gain busters in this each replenishment with these types of items. And then we're also growing double digits in units in major appliances. So if you think about it, the things we're growing in are the hardest, most expensive things to move, right? Each, each, eaches of small units, e-commerce, store replenishment, and then you know, a $20,000 Viking refrigerator that has to move through. But we had a cool thing going on. A lot of these appliance distribution centers were already in our major markets. Right? We had four or 500,000 square feet set aside so that we could launch 30, 40, 50 home delivery routes every morning. And as we really thought about how do we, if we wanna get closer to customer in the e-commerce side and be fast, is there a way to put our really big hitting, fast moving e-com SKUs inside this old school manual replenishment building. Uh, this one happens to be in Compton, uh, California. It's literally six or seven miles from LA. There's some crazy number that there's like 20 million people within a 15 mile radius of this facility. So what we were able to do as we went and looked at, for the right solutions, again, I talked about the right systems, we looked at a lot of different things. We found a great company. Well, we found a great integrator in Bastion. And then we found a great company called AutoStore. And this is our facility in Danuba, California. 150,000 locations. Those team members used to walk seven to eight miles a day to do the old school picking. Now they stand in place at that goods to person station. 150,000 bins, 195 bots. And needless to say, we are rocking and rolling out of that facility, store-friendly de deliveries segregated by the aisle so that they go right to shelf. And we can do all that in the dark, which is that represents right there. We can turn the lights off and have those bots start to sequence before we come in. We complemented the big RDC with a smaller Metro e-commerce center, which this, that's our Compton facility, which is right in the heart of it and co-mingle that mech right there. This allows us to, our shoppers can shop late into the evening. We can drop the order in. We have great automated packaging from our friends from Italy and CMC. State-of-the-art packaging we're working with. We've bought three of those machines from them. Um, because the environment is very important as well and not sending out all this dunnage and different things as well. So we, I think the one thing we realized was that everybody's tinkering with automated storage and retrieval, how to do that better. But what we saw around the world was nobody was really thinking about the solution outside of the box, if you will. So why spend all this money there to have it show up in now a manual environment after the bots go and retrieve everything, you have nothing else to do. So we've really been working hard on that. 
The other thing I'm trying to represent here, Bastion didn't help us with this, but you know we've grown about 24 or five quarters in a row in major appliances, so we've had to build uh, and right size nine new of these delivery distribution centers to make sure we're ready for all of our, our growth in the appliance business. So again, the method to the madness is you look at that old school, right? This is, these are the DCs I grew up in on the left. And we just can't compete out of that environment when it's 200, 300 miles from the major markets, um, doing things out of rack locations, old school pick mods. So to be able to have a facility like that in the heart of LA, where the price per square foot is pretty expensive, and take a storage system that reduces our footprint 65, 70%, real dense storage, allow our customers to shop late into the evening, hand those orders over to FedEx, UPS, crowdsourcing, whatever you name it, and deliver it the very next day and actually do it at a lower cost to serve than the old school way. So that, I just, you know, that's uh, lots of hundreds of millions of dollars of work, uh, lots of people, a gazillion um, man hours of work, but that was really the basic tenets of, of what we were doing. Now, there's still a place for the RDC. You know, we still have our big uh, old school RDCs that we have retrofitted. We are retrofitting with the auto store um, for the store replenishment. And then, as you can see here, we've complemented that with these MECs, Metro E-Commerce Centers, LA, New York, Chicago. So it's very scientific why we picked LA, Chicago, and New York to drop these in. A lot of people ask me, what about your stores? I think the other thing here is our stores are still um, a major, major component of how we fulfill. You know, we still, on average, about 30 to 40% on any given day of our units, we're going to drop in a store. So stores are very important to us. We have 1,000 stores out there, um, great men and women that work in those stores. And when we need them, we're going to them. But when you get into a New York, you get into Chicago, you get into a Los Angeles, think about uh, Cyber Monday. We might drop three to four million units that day. If I asked every store, the thousand stores, to handle those three million units, that's 3,000 units a store, about a unit and a half per package. You're talking a couple of thousand packages a day that a store would have to handle. And oh, by the way, they gotta go get this off the shelf before somebody in the store grabs it because we've committed to somebody that lives in Denver, that iPhone. So again, there is a time and a place for the store, but we really like the solution that we've come across with Bastion, um, Auto Store, our friends at CMC, others that are working with us collaborating to come up with what we think is a pretty unique solution to use our regional distribution centers, a metro e-commerce center, that has an appliance home delivery operation embedded in it, on with our stores complementing, has really given us the edge to take you know, average shipping times that were a couple of years ago during holiday that averaged five or six days, calendar days, down to just a couple of days. There's actually an article written in Fortune in the fourth quarter saying that we have caught Amazon speed and uh, you don't have to pay the $99 price to do it. So we're very proud of that. Um, I think if you watch the news, we're also doing joint ventures with Amazon as well and different fulfillment and whatnot. So instead of trying to uh, copy each other every day of the week, we really have a good partnership and work well with them um, and working side by side. So those are the basic tenets in 10 minutes. I probably ran over my time just to give you a flair and a feel of what we've been up to and uh, why that was so important to the success of uh, what's going on at Best Buy. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mark. Thanks, Rob. That was a, it's just a great success story on the company and the process that they went to, and they're, they're, just, they're just doing great, and a lot of it has got to do with the leadership at the top, so we really appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the, the work that was done prior to some of the installation of the equipment and, and systems that are in the new facilities. Um, you know, a big part of this at the very beginning was, was modeling the supply chain and understanding where the demand was coming from, where the right location to put these new facilities that they were going to build. And 
that's done through a supply chain optimization or network modeling project. Um, it's gathering the data, uh, you know, obviously things like uh, transportation costs, labor costs, um, facility location costs, and uh, using that to, to create very um, robust models to help do what-if an analysis, and then to finally hone in on where these facilities should be to cover the demand that's, that's required in, in the current and obviously in the future. Um, once that was done, uh, we use a, a five-step process when we ever we start any kind of uh, automation project. It's an engineering approach. It's our take on an engineering approach. Uh, it's got five steps. Uh, the first one is definition. So we want to make sure we're very clear up front on all the goals um, set forth by the client and uh, understand those very thoroughly. Um, it's, it's things like interviewing folks at the, at the operations level to find out where they're pain points are, it's uh, setting expectations for ROI, it's things like that. So it's a he heavy definition phase. And then we get into a measurement phase where we're collecting information. Uh, a lot of it is electronic, uh, order, order information, SKU information, um, if we have it, dimensional data on the products, uh, all that. So that, that's a lot of, of data that we then would build into a very large uh, database, a data model, uh, and then we analyze it. So uh, that an analysis is, is to make sure we understand all the metrics and, and what's going to be required um, and, and what's going to be required in the future as well. Um, but it's also uh, using that model to, to predict and understand what different technologies might make sense and what sizing uh, they're going to need to make sense at. So uh, that's what that modeling effort is, is used for. It's not until we do all that, and that's a big effort, that we start you know, putting the proverbial pen to paper and start doing design work. So uh, that's the next phase, that's step four. Uh, once we've come up with designs and we've, we've uh, done the costing and everything that goes along with that, uh, we have a validation step, which always involves making sure that there's payback, that there's gonna be a, a, the, the right ROI for the solutions we come up with. But many times it involves validating the design through uh, things like simulation modeling or proof of concepts, that type of thing as well. So in the case of, um, Best Buy here, you know, they, they have a, um, I would say, a, a typical in the sense that a uh, very high spike in, uh, in seasonal demand, but uh, extremely so. So you can see there during their holiday uh, time, their e-commerce, uh, 20 times average is what they, what they look at. We see numbers, you know, anywhere, um, you know, 9, 13, but, but 20 is, is super high for us. And then even in the volume that's going through the stores during the retail season, it goes up two to three times as well during average. So huge spikes in the data. Um, the other thing we want to understand kind of from a very high metric perspective is, is what their channel characteristics are. So you can see from, from this uh, line here, or this chart, a lot of numbers, but the, you know, the ones that to hone in on is that um, the units per line and the, and the lines per order you know, they're trying to fulfill uh, um, both channels out of uh, the, the same facilities. So they look different. They look very different. And we wanted technologies and systems in place that could handle both those kind of volumes, those, those huge spikes, and, and uh, also the, the difference in the, the types of uh, orders they're dealing with. Um, SKU Pareto is interesting as well, trying to understand, you know, what, what percent of the items are accounting for what percent of the orders. Um, you can see that the retail is a little bit you know, flatter. Uh, it's not the typical 80-20, it's a little bit less than that. Um, the, uh, on the e-commerce side, it's the opposite. You, know, you expect 80-20, it's 87-20. Uh, you know, uh, so a little bit more steep so than it would be typical. But the other thing to really look at there is that last line. 75% um, you know, of the units are 100%. Well, that's really because the other 25% are that long tail you know, that they have, that, that uh, they still have to hold. People are still interested in buying those, but they just don't move a whole heck of a lot. Uh, this is another uh, viewpoint of just, you know, what that holiday demand and spike, especially for e-commerce, looks like if you just compare it to, the, you know, every day of the year. Um, it looks like, a, you know, a, um, someone's heartbeat that, that finally just died, right? So that's, what, that's what it reminds me of. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Greg. He's going to talk about the, the, uh, the solutions that came out of the data analysis. Thank you, Marvin. 
So if, if every you know, problem or opportunity in this world was a nail, then the only tool that we would need is a hammer. And um, it obviously is not that case. So when we get done with the consulting analysis, the data analysis, and we've, we're on that path to what the right solution, what the right technology might be for each application, we want to look at it uh, really at a blank slate. And we want to evaluate many different uh, technologies out there all the way from conventional uh, material handling solutions all the way through the, the very most uh, complex solutions available. So for this opportunity, some of the things that we looked at, some of the different technologies, we looked at um, a shuttle-based system, we looked at uh, the OPEX Perfect Pick system, and we also evaluated the auto store solution, which we'll talk in a little bit more detail about. So each one of these different types of solutions has its pluses and its minuses. You know, all the way from uh, picking throughput to storage density. And, and although storage density is very, very important, that isn't the only criteria that should be evaluated. And that's exactly what we did is we took an evaluation and we looked at really what would be the most perfect application of technology for Best Buy, not only in the RDC, but also in the MEC. Because we, what we did not want to have, uh, collectively the two teams, did not want to have a solution that was one off. We didn't want an RDC to feature technology that we wouldn't be able to quickly you know, read apply at the MEC level so that the commonality of the solution through, throughout the supply chain would be very much the same. So auto store and, um, and why auto store specifically is again we wanted to find a solution that we could quickly deploy in an existing brownfield operation so the existing RDCs that Best Buy had in their network and many of the existing DDCs or those uh, warehouses where they're shipping out their large appliances that we were gonna rebrand as an MEC. So to do that, we needed something that we could stand up very quickly. We also needed something that was very modular and that we could add upon. So AutoStore offers all of that, tech, all of that to us. The other, some of the other goals that we looked at when we selected this technology is we wanted to reduce the number of touch points. We didn't want to have a solution in place where operators had to handle and rehandle the products throughout the supply chain. We also wanted the ability to, to batch products at the goods to, to person workstation. We wanted to make sure that we were picking in the most optimized fashion possible. And again, we wanted to have one solution one automated storage and retrieval type solution that fit both the MEC and the RDC. So again, just recapping the solutions that we implemented at the RDCs, the five RDCs, we're in the process of implementing um, a system that consists of 150,000 bins of auto store and 195 robots. And if you contrast that with the MECs and Best Buy's networks that are gonna be for that last mile fulfillment, there's 30,000 bins and 73 robots. So just a, a little bit smaller scale than compared to the RDC. So, real quick, I'm doing a... Hello. Hello. There you go. <laughs> just real quick, I, we kind of are doing a quick swap here. So I, I mentioned, um, you know, the validation process. Uh, huge when you get the, the real complex systems like what we have here with a lot of moving parts and uh, trying to understand uh, you know if they're going to be any systematic bottlenecks we're going to be able to make um, the rates that we promise to the customer um, any kind of what if type analysis uh, we really recommend it and we, we did simulation analysis for this for this project so uh, in this case we used uh, FlexSim uh, to be able to, to model it uh, as well as all the, the simulation uh, capabilities that, that AutoStore has as well. So just wanted to mention that, that that's a huge import, a very part, an important part of our, uh, the project for, for Best Buy. So I think at this time, uh, we'd like to open up the floor if there's any questions. Myself and Marvin and Rob would be happy to answer any questions you may have. We in the back? Yeah. I believe the, the question was, how do you manage the product mix in the auto store? Okay, 
I, if I understand the question, it's how do we manage the product mix in auto store when looking at fast movers and looking at slow moving items? Go ahead. Yeah, Can I so, answer? Sure. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I have my own view on this, and uh, these guys have a much more technical answer than, than <laughs> I do. I just tell you this. As we looked at the auto store and visited sites all over the world, I think the one thing that really resonated for me and I talk to my team about all the time is sometimes you just got to forget what you've learned, right? And we were trying to sometimes look at the auto store and say, okay, where are, you know, where's our reserve? Where's our flow? Where's our fast movers? Where's our slow movers? Where's bulk? Where's this? Where's that? And I had uh, this gentleman in Norway at a, at a company that had uh, auto store installed and he, and he looked at me and he says, man, you just need to forget all that. He said, just dump everything you can into the auto store and let it happen. And now the team does much more scientific work than that. But I think what I've seen, you start to get too cute and saying, well, they're fast movers, so why waste the time to put them in and we'll go create this own little area to act with that, right? Just, I tell my team, let's, let's put it in there. Um, you can decide, do you want, do you want a bin to only hold one unit, two units, three units, four units, five units? And again, lots of math involved in that, but I believe, particularly for us, especially we built it to grow into, so you have 150,000, I'd rather see more in there than not. So even if it's one unit or two units, if it fits, let's put it in there. It's nice and safe, it's clean storage, right? We got a lot of high-end electronics, we can put it in there and know that it's in there and it's locked in the vault, if you will. Now, there might be a time and a place where we need to get a little bit cute with it, but then we might decide to expand or whatnot. But, you know, there is a rhyme, rhyme or reason as what goes in and what doesn't, but I think the, the jury's still out on that. And I like to lean in on the side of forget a little bit of what we've known and put more in than less. Yeah, uh, absolutely right, absolutely right. And I, and I think just to further a little bit on what Rob said, is really the whole principle and the concept of auto store. Just by the nature of the way auto store works, your top moving, your fastest SKUs are always going to stay on that first couple layers of the bins, of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the actual stack. So as you get deeper down, the, the items that move the most frequent are not going to be in the way. It's actually going to make the system work more productive as you continue to use auto store. Can take the first one. You can take the second one. Sure. That's sure. So, um, you know, there's a. This is a, a question we have to come up with 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 every e-commerce site. How, how we size the the system. Um, you know, we we couldn't we couldn't build the system to handle that one peak day. It'd be way too expensive, right? So, um, with every project, we have to decide what's going to be the reasonable span to take that that peak volume and spread it over to meet all the. Um, delivery requirements that you, you know you need to make and, and make sure your customers are happy and that type of thing. Um, and in this case, I think it was 10 days is what we decided on that we would be able to take that that peak day inbound volume and spread it over 10 days, and that would that would satisfy customers. That would that would make it uh, a system that you know would be uh, reasonable in, in size and cost. Um, so that's how we handle it. So so what you were seeing there was inbound volume coming in. The chart that I showed it's that that those peak that 20. X day is really spread over 10 days. It's still huge. Um, anything more than that would have just, you know, would have been a waste of capital, really. I would, just, I would just add to that, you know, as we modeled it out years and years in advance, we never wanted to get, we talked to some people, and some of you in the room might be familiar, Thanksgiving Day, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, next thing you know, your backlog's so big, you're not coming clean till mid-December. We started extrapolating that we were a few years away from not being able to get things to people's homes by Christmas that they might have ordered Cyber Monday. So worst case scenario, you know, when we're fully built and volumes are continuing to grow 15, 20% a year, I wouldn't want to be more than that seven to 10 days. The way we're building it now, 
we're, we don't believe we're ever going to pick clean that day on, on Cyber Monday or Black Friday, but we should be able to get to a place where we're recovered within a couple of days. And that's kind of, and it's that fine line, you know, of do you build the church for Easter Sunday? You know, we ship 24% of our e-commerce volume for the year is picked, packed, and shipped in a two-week window. Think about that. 24% of our years in a two-week window. So we, we never, we talked about all the time, if we built out what we needed to come clean during those peak times, we would have had such, we would have had a lot of MHE equipment collecting dust the other 11 months of the year. And so how do you strike a balance where you're efficient in May and June and that you still got a, a pretty good horsepower? Now we also have some other interesting things we're looking at of how you use these tools to perhaps sell fulfillment as a service, and different things as well. There's lots of things we have in our arsenal now that we have this kind of storage and we can be nimble and those bots are agnostics to whose product is in there. Or even if they're parts from our geek squad that we need to sequence out parts so that they can go make 15 stops today and fix a couple of refrigerators, a TV and whatever. We can have those motherboards in the auto store. We can have our goods in the auto store. We can have all kinds of stuff in the auto store. It doesn't care. I like to say it's like a vending machine. You got Twinkies, pretzels, bubble gum. You hit E6 for Twinkies, you hit B2 for bubble gum, right? And it comes out the way you want it. So that's how we're looking at it as well. well what was the other? The side? second question I think was how do you replenish the MECs? Yeah, so the MECs, you know, right now the way we look at the MEC is there's been a lot of debate about this. We got, I saw my friend from KSA just walked in as well. Uh, so they always like to provide their intellectual feedback to us, and we debate it, but I think they're aligned along with Bastion. We're treating the MECs right now like a, just to think of it as a store, right? So we, we just added a store to New York, a store to LA, and a store to Chicago. Um, we don't cut POs to the MEC. We send it to our RDCs. Then we replenish. We actually load them up with totes based on what we know they will need in those markets, based on what our promo SKUs are going to be, what's going to be hot online, what, what we think gonna, it's going to need, and we pretend it's a store and we replenish it, but we're able, imagine your little uh, Pez dispenser, right? You can just take it out and plug it right in, and it goes right into the auto store, and we're load up for that next promo event with the right SKUs in the right location. So that's how we're looking at it. There's a lot of debate about using it as well for um, hot replenishment in those markets for retail as well. Um, I push my team on that every day, but that's a whole nother integration piece and, and different things, but we'll get there as well to make those sort of hot replenishments, not only to a customer at home, but also to our stores in those markets. Yeah. yeah I got a lot of passion about this one too. I'm just taking over your That's show. That's okay, you're so good. So the qu I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'm not sure everybody can hear it, but the question was, when we were designing the auto store grid in the RDCs and the MECs, did we plan for expansion? Yep. My biggest frustration when I came over about five and a half years ago was, you know, we, we were in off-sites in almost all of our delivery distribution centers. Nobody had really thought through e-commerce and we're under siege and there was no, in case of emergency, break, break glass, like what's the plan? So as we built this plan out, we were really focused to say, okay, these, based on all the data, here's what we think you're, the bots and the storage for the next 10 years. But I was obsessed with this concept to say, all right, but if when I'm 10 years from now, when I'm out playing golf and we hand this over to somebody else, what is the plan in the file that says, when you need 30% more bins, where do you go? So we've sketched that out to know based on how we've put them or slotted them into our facilities to say, when we need 30% more bins, we're going this way. We might have to move a little conveyance, but this will be the least intrusive. So we literally, we have that roadmap in a folder ready to go, if you will, so that we, we can do that. So that's how we've, how we've looked at that. Actually thought through it in the front end. And by the way, the auto store, you can pick it up and move it. They claim you can, I don't know, I've never actually tried. <laughs> but uh, I think that's the other thing, right? You're talking about aluminum rails and bots and, and, and totes. So if we ever do have to pick up and go, um, Bastion and Auto Store promise me, uh, we might just test them on this someday to see, that we can pick up and go if we had to. I doubt that we ever would, but 
you know, a lot of the systems I worked with in my career, there was no way you were ever leaving that piece of real estate. There's no way. And I actually believe it in this case. When you look at how fast these guys can put up an auto store now, I've walked in a facility and there's nothing there and I come back four or five weeks later and the thing's basically built. And all they're doing is working on the integration work behind the scenes. It's pretty cool. I, I believe your question was accuracy and reliability. Okay. I'll, I'll speak from the integrator's perspective and Rob can speak from the end user's perspective, but as far as reliability goes, the reliability of auto store is fantastic. And you know, there's always cases, mechanical equipment, where something's gonna fail, something's gonna go down. But what's so cool about AutoStore is that it's built on redundancy. Just because one bot has a hiccup, your system is still running. So even though we may have one hiccup here, the reliability uptime of the AutoStore system is still 99.999%. It's fantastic, it's a great tool for reliability. And then in terms of accuracy, the accuracy of the picker, or of the actual pick, is significantly better than what you would see in a manual operation because we are limiting the amount of touches that the operator is, is handling the single products. We're gonna bring that product in from the dock, we're gonna decant it into AutoStore, and then we're gonna pick it out. So as long as the software is keeping track of, the, of that single AutoStore bin in the grid, the opportunity for a, a picking error is extremely low. And you're only bringing out, you know, what's ordered. There's no other, they have no access to any other SKUs. You know, so, so the, you know, the, the typical picking mistakes is, you know, you're either picking the wrong item or the wrong quantity. Well, you can't pick the wrong item because it's not in front of you. Yep. Probably still pick the wrong quantity, but that's, that's limited as well. So. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing is, I talked about this vault, right? You've all seen the, the DCs where we've all been forced to build the cardboard cubbies right, to create locations and rack pallet locations that were designed for it. And there's just stuff sitting out there and people are grabbing one versus the other and it's, it's a mess. Again, when, when AutoStore presents a SKU to you, it presents only a SKU to you, you can't even reach in and grab anything else, right? It's, it's, the, it's the tote that has all of those 256 gig iPhones. To their point, it, it might say put one in that, in that donor, but it, when you put it in there, if you take two, of course a human can make that mistake, but you're gonna get the right product presented to you. Uh, and, and then again, just the integrity of having it in there and not having it as an incentive um, to find its way somewhere else in the building is, is a, a huge thing for us as well. Yeah. I think that you were first. The, the question was, does Best Buy have only one SKU per tote, or are there situations where there are multiple SKUs in each tote of the auto store? So, let me put it this way. We have the ability to, I believe, Dwayne's out there, to go four SKUs, I think, per tote. We've taken the approach now, though, when we built something we could grow into. So, my thought was, we have 150,000 bins available. We carry 14-ish thousand SKUs. I don't know, maybe 10 of them are eligible for, you know, we can't put a 75-inch TV in the auto store, just so you know that, we can't do that. But again, the SKUs that are eligible, why not as we learn the system, members learn the system, let's keep it simple for them for now and keep it one SKU per tote let them get comfortable with the auto store. But we know, and, and we made it so that we actually, we can slot them. Um, they actually have some inserts in there. Uh, and, and there will be a time and a place where we'll probably go to two or three or even four yeah. uh, SKUs per tote. But it would be for those rural, rural slow yeah. that end up making their way down to the bottom. But right now we just don't need to do it um, based no. on our situation. Yeah, when we do that, when we do have, and we have a lot of systems that have multiple SKUs per tote, we will, uh, we do something, we, we have a, a product called LumiPick, which um, will actually illuminate the um, quadrant or, or section of the, of the tote that they pick out of. Um, and then also on the display, it shows a visual picture of the, of the, of the bin and what, again, what, what quadrant they need to pick out of. Um, it's really hard to make a mistake. I mean, you, 
is you almost almost want to make a mistake. You know, I mean, it's really hard. I tell you, the other thing, my our vision was always. I say when you you get a new iPhone and you take the box off, and you touch it, and you feel like you know how to use it. The other thing we need to talk at these GTPs. You know, I literally we had our CEO out, and our CEO doesn't think about picking very much. We put him in a GTP, and within 10 seconds he was picking. Right. So last fourth quarter in our first couple of installs, our ability to get in a, a seasonal or temporary worker off the streets, we used to have to put them through all this training. All right, to go walk your eight miles a day, you have to hit this button, F10, uh, function three, enter, scroll to this screen. Um, now we put them in a GTP and it's, it's like that iPhone. They look at the screen and it says, what's in front of you? Pick the light, put two of them there. Okay, two, boom. Put one there, okay, one. And when, when the last one, when they hit the button, Auto store takes it away and the next SKU is presented. So we're getting people up to speed in 10, 15 minutes, saving millions of dollars. You think about the training and all those things as well. So that's uh, another huge advantage. Yes. From the time when you engage fast to when the first pick happened in all the Oh, wow. That's a good question. Dwayne, do you know the answer? From the time we engaged Bastion to the time we made our first pick, Probably somewhere between 14 and 18 months, 12 months, huh? about a year. We went, you know, we went, uh, it's, it's hard for, how do we get to look and actually shop all these products that these integrators offer? Four months. And nobody wants to let me or your companies go look at their stuff. Right, so we did this field trip in the summer to Europe with a lot of integrators. Got back from that field trip. It was obvious that we were going to go with Auto Store and Bastion. We struck the deal. That was probably late, late October. summer. Yeah, I, October. Yeah, and we were picking by September of the next year. So right around a year, start to finish, and that's from like what should we buy to we're picking. Yeah, that's real. I think that's real fast in this day and age. Yeah, heck, there's mundane decisions we make in corporate America that take two years to make. So to do that one was pretty, <laughs> was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. The qu the question was so uh, the transition. How was the transition from their legacy WMS green screen WMS to their current WMS? Yeah, and we you know we pieced that out. We did that the year prior to this. And uh, I believe that was another about year and a half to two years to change out all of our RDCs off of that to, uh, well, I don't mind saying we went Manhattan, right? So uh, it's pretty much any integrator or any new solution we talked to, they had all worked with Manhattan. So I'm not here to promote one or the other, so we went Manhattan. So it took us about you know 18 months to flip out the systems, we're simultaneously figuring out what the MHE solution is. The minute the last WMS is in, now we come in with this solution and away we go. And I would say we're not quite way, uh, we, we have three of these up and running now, and we have four that are under construction as we speak, and we'll get those up and running before our holiday season, and then we'll hit the ground running with a whole nother batch. That's the other thing we've been able to most times in our business, you have to shut everything down during the peak season and then pick it back up in January, February. So it's been nice because the auto store is, again, it's dense. We've been able in most cases to clear away and keep construction going through the holiday, which is unheard of in our business. You know, I don't know about you guys, but usually you gotta shut down, get to your core business and then fire it up again. So it's been really a, a cool thing to be able to keep the roadmap going for our transformation through the holiday instead of shutting down. And I was fascinated to be in our New Jersey facility over the holidays and we're booming for Christmas or whatnot. And they're building an auto store in November and December, which is mind blowing to me. 38 seconds. Oh. I 
I, I believe the question was, did we have to make, did Best Buy have to make changes to the way they currently handle freight and outbound shipping? Did, did I understand your question? And loading auto store. Yeah, so the, the decanting, we call it, it's kind of a fancy term, I just think of wine, but we decant. If you think, at a certain point, somebody's gonna have to in this each environment, eventually somebody's gonna have to get it out of the box and detrash it and whatnot. We used to pass a lot of that off to our stores, right? Because if we'd send the inner and they get shrink wrap and this and that. So this has allowed us in a really efficient manner and uh, we probably should have been sent more time talking about the decant, but we can have the inbound doors that have all the candidates for the auto store. You bring them in and doors that are right in front of that. You unload the, the pallets, you drive them right up to the edge of the auto store, cut the boxes open and put all of those eaches right in those totes and then have a takeaway for all the trash. Do every, and, and then you're in business and nobody's ever got to think about it again. So yeah, we, we changed the process, but I would say for the better. All the replenishment moves we were doing in the past and the repack mods and then having empty cartons of stuff four levels up in a mod and paying utility attendants to go up there and get the garbage, just a disaster. And then plus what we passed on to stores as well. So it's a really clean, efficient, uh, I'm actually surprised how impressed I was with this decant process of how you put goods in. But it's kind of the one and done, the team gets really good at it and now you never have to think about it again. So we did change the process up a little bit. So as you say, you've seen the improvements in Best Buy. Well, oh, that's a thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll buy you the beer when we're done. <laughs> What are the top challenges? And then we're gonna to have to go, right? What are the top challenges we've seen? Because it sounds all too rosy right now, which I understand. And then how does data analytics and AI and machine learning, you sound like a board member. My board is ours, and I said, I don't even know what blockchain is or AI. I don't know what any of that stuff is, but I'll answer your question. Um, I would say the biggest, the biggest challenge really is just getting that first one in. Um, you know, it, it just getting that first one in, the integration piece of it, it's easy to build, but making sure we have so many systems, you know, these big, our big companies, we're all part. So that integration work is really the top challenge. It's, it's always probably more expensive and, and more challenging than we ever say in a meeting during a, a steering committee. So that's the biggest challenge. Um, I won't call this a big challenge, but then once it's in, it all looks great. You do have to get used to how to use it. There's a lot of math these guys use on batch factors and this and that and whatever and, and things we told them to be true about our business and not everything we told them was true. So, you know, figuring that out and the best way to utilize this new tool and kind of break some of those paradigms and get people thinking differently is, is what we're challenged with. But we, again, we're very happy with the solution and everything that, that we've had. And then as far as um, you know, your, your next question, that really is, you know, I, I see my, my friends from KSA in the room, I just met with them the other day around data, analytics, AI, um, what to do next. And you know, this really is that sort of next genre, if you will. It's easy to say, put one of these in LA, Chicago, New York. That sounds about the right size but to really get tactical on how we source, how we look at stores differently, and we're looking at different types of fulfillment stores versus a MEC versus an RDC. Um, you know, demand planning now rolls under our supply chain, so as we think about, it's not just good enough to create new fulfillment venues and final mile solutions, you also have to think about where you place the goods. 
right? So we've taken in demand planning and forecasting as well to make sure that you can't build all these cool new things and then put all your goods in the wrong spot. So that's probably, that's where we're leaning in to AI, better understand um, how we should place those goods and how we should think about it is probably 